um, I'm pretty sure I know everyone on this uh, on here and everyone probably knows me, but I'm Kristen Dwyer. I'm the ultrasound division director and I'm going to be talking about ultrasound today. So I'm going to go through like a sort of smorgasbord of topics or a real um, mix of topics today. I know that I've got, got a lot of lectures that I've given and some of you have heard certain lectures five times and heard other lectures never. So I wanted to do something new and go through like a really big range of topics. And I wanted to actually highlight a lot of ultrasounds that you guys have been doing. So it's a little bit of a different format. We'll see if it's a flop or if it goes well. Hopefully it goes well. Um, but what I did is I went through QA and pulled out a lot of cool cases that you guys have all done in the past couple um, of months. These are all like really recent images from the past two months and I'm using them to go through some um, learning points on ultrasound. And I'm gonna ask, um, I don't have the chat feature at all, as you can see on my screen. So there might be times where I ask for some participation, which would be great. It's so hard on Zoom when um, you're not seeing faces or hearing anybody. So if you guys can hop in um, and uh, you know make it an interactive lecture, I'd love that. Um, so I'm gonna go through a number of cases and then talk about some learning points from the case. And this is a case, this was um, Lindsay Miller, and I think it was Kamat that had this patient. It was at Rhode Island. So it was a 30-year-old patient. And this is just a couple of weeks ago. So she got brought in by EMS. She was, her blood pressures were not that good, kind of like high 80s, low 90s. Um, she was having some abdominal cramping. And apparently she was going to um, the bathroom and had had a syncopal episode. Um, so she had sort of a, a prodrome and went out, uh, woke up, was feeling kind of crampy, belly pain, didn't feel that well, and so called EMS and came in to get evaluated. So she shows up in the ER, any thoughts initially, what, it, what are you sort of like thinking, what kinds of things might you want to do, what kinds of things might you want to know? Thirty-year-old with syncope, belly pain, and hypotension in an ultrasound lecture. Any thoughts? ectopic pregnancy rupture yeah ectopic is going to be up there right it's probably going to be sort of one two and three so on further sort of questioning you know obviously you you, you don't want to just sort of assume that there are a lot of other things that could be going on maybe she just was you know having a bowel movement and had a vagal episode um, maybe a lot of different things but certainly ectopic should be high up there and on further questioning, um, you know, Lindsay found out the patient was a couple weeks, um, or sorry, two months past her last LMP. She um, had been having unprotected intercourse with multiple partners. So ectopic or, or something pregnancy related is certainly, um, you know, becoming higher in the differential. She'd been having some vaginal bleeding as well. So could she be having a miscarriage with a lot of bleeding? Could this be an ectopic? Um, so certainly could be an ectopic. So um, what did Lindsay do and her team? Amazingly, they did an ultrasound. Um, and so I'm gonna kind of go through this and then I'll have Lindsay is actually just gonna pop in and give a one-liner on the case. But I thought this was a really good case to share in light of Josh doing his M&M on ectopic pregnancies recently. And we'd highlighted a number of cases where there had been a delay in diagnosis due to not performing a point of care ultrasound at the bedside. And for, you know, it's something that's obviously very important to me, but also for our patients, anybody that you're suspicious of an ectopic pregnancy should not be going to radiology until we look. And I feel really strongly about that. If you haven't looked to evaluate for an IUP or a FAST exam, you should not be sending them to radiology, right? So Lindsay did exactly that. She took a look at this patient. And if you see here on the left-hand side, um, it's, you know, you may, as we're sort of fanning through, just say like, geez, I don't even know what that is. So where do we start? So first of all, we've got a curvilinear, things I always look at when I'm evaluating ultrasounds is what probe was used, what preset was used. So this footprint here is the curvilinear probe, which is the exact right probe or the abdominal probe. It's in the musculoskeletal setting, you know, who cares? It doesn't matter. We're seeing exactly what we need to see. Um, abdominal setting is a little bit better. It, the, the settings help you because they adjust your um, frequency, penetration, harmonics, et cetera, to help optimize the image for that type of exam. But Lindsay is seeing exactly what she needs to see with this image, so I could care less what preset she selected. 
I'm going to pause the video and um, scroll back and then see um, if you guys can identify um, any, um, any sort of things here. So what do we have here? What am I? Bueller. So that's the uterus, right? So we've got the uterus. Marker is pointed to the patient's head. So up here is head, down here is feet. This is the abdominal wall, and this is the back. And it can be hard, right? We do QA all the time and you're looking at these images. When you don't have your hand on the probe, sometimes you're like, geez, what the heck is that? So that's uterus, right? So vaginal canal comes up here, cervix and uterus comes up and over the bladder. So this is your sagittal view. And so even though this image, as you sort of fan through, looks like totally distorted and unrecognizable, you are able to make out the uterus and the bladder. What I can say when we're seeing the uterus is I do not see any intrauterine pregnancy in there. And then you're also seeing all this um, kind of stuff outside of the uterus that looks really, really abnormal. And anybody that's doing a reasonable number of fast exams or abdominal exams would recognize that doesn't look normal. And then over here on the right hand side, what she's got is um, a huge amount of free fluid, right? So back here, you've got the iliopsoas muscle. And I'll kind of pause this because I, um, I know on Zoom, these images really don't come, the videos don't play that well as we've learned from butter the past six months. Um, but sort of some recognizable things, we've got kidney hair, right? You got iliopsoas muscles, gonna always be posterior to the kidney. And I'll see if I can, right? So that's beautiful, iliopsoas muscle. And then you've got your vertebral bodies. So really, really nice image. And she has a belly full of blood. Um, you can actually see like the tip of the liver coming in up here, up high, and then all this anechoic stuff. So to be positive for a fast, depending on what you believe and, and how good your probe is, and if they're in Trendelenburg, you, know, you need a few hundred cc's just to be positive. Some say 500, but if you're, you can probably see less fluid than that. This is a patient who probably has a few liters of blood in her belly. So um, I, in light of this sort of recent m and was very excited to see um, Lindsay and Kamat doing um, the best thing for their patient, identifying this at the bedside rather than sending them to radiology. Um, and then Lindsay, are you there? Can you just give us like a one-liner on how that worked, how you interface with Gyne? Because it sounds like you were able to get that patient to the OR pretty easily, pretty quickly. Yeah, so can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, so yeah, it was actually, I mean, I think it was like a perfect storm of um, like resources and availability. It was like noontime. I think it might have been the day after the m and &M that this happened. Um, we did this bedside ultrasound right after the patient got to the ED. Um, we called Gyne right away and they actually consented the patient for the OR prior to even the positive pregnancy test resulting. It happened to result uh, right before she went up, but they were, you know, they had booked her for the OR prior to that resulting. Um, uh, so she went to the OR before anything else resulted. Um, you know, of course, her quant was very, very positive. The, the pregnancy test was positive. She ended up having two and a half liters in her abdomen, um, but she um, did, did great um, and recovered really well. Um, and it was like great teamwork. And I, I gave them really good feedback too, um, just to kind of positively reinforce, you know, the whole ask, you know, the whole case um you know they came down and i was just like thank you so much for like coming right down and like you know uh 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 coming and doing the right thing for the patient um and i think it was just like an awesome job like teamwork wise from and i think probably they were reacting to some of those m, &M cases too um and had those fresh on on their mind um but I think overall, just like from start to finish, I think she got, she was like in the OR, I think an, an hour or an hour and a half after she arrived. And that was just amazing. So it was amazing. And it was, Kamat was your attending, is that right? Yes. 
Okay, yeah. So great job, right? This is like exactly what we want to do for our patients. And sending someone with two and a half liters of blood in their belly to get a comprehensive study in radiology where they might be head of the department for God knows how long is totally not the right thing to do by our patients. So just remember this case, anyone you have that's a real ectopic, make sure you look at their abdomen with the probe before you send them to radiology. If they have a belly full of blood, they should not be going to radiology. And if they have an intrauterine pregnancy on their bedside ultrasound, um, then I'm not sure, you know, we don't really need to be sending them to radiology a lot of the times anyway. So you should be looking. And so this is a great job and great teamwork. And I was very excited after Josh's m and to see this case. So thanks guys. So just going through really, really quickly um, in terms of, you know, we see less of this because of women and infants than we do at other hospitals. And so I think it's good to just keep reinforcing what we're looking for. And what you're looking for when you're, look, when you're concerned about an ectopic is you're not really, you're sort of ruling in an intrauterine pregnancy. Um, and in a case of a patient who is not on fertility treatment, the likelihood of a heterotopic is so extremely, extremely, extremely low that ruling in intrauterine pregnancy basically is essentially ruling out an ectopic. There are times where you'll see an ectopic, and I had a case of that in Miriam. There was this like very clear, big ectopic sac outside of the uterus, but generally you're looking for, is there an intrauterine pregnancy? And how do you define that? So intrauterine pregnancy, you need a gestational sac, and then you need a yolk sac or a fetal pole, right? So the yolk sac is that little Cheerio or a little fetal pole. And you need um, at least one of those, the yolk sac or the fetal pole to call it an intrauterine pregnancy. A gestational sac in and of itself is not adequate. And then in addition to that, it has to be in the uterus and in the uterus, which is what I sort of always say. So here you've got um, an example of a uterus and then you've got your sort of endometrium with the, um, you've got both a yolk sac, which is that Cheerio, and this fetal pulse. So that is a definitive intrauterine pregnancy. It's got a yolk sac, it's got a fetal pulse, it has a gestational sac, it's in the uterus, and it's in the uterus. And what I mean by that is, in contrast, you look over here on the right-hand side of the screen, and you'll notice up here there's sort of a different... Um, uh, a sort of, well, it's cut off a bit, so I apologize, but the, this on the right is an intercavitary probe, so that's a transvaginal ultrasound, um, as opposed to the image on the left, that sort of um, um, softer curve is an abdominal probe, so you know that this is an abdominal and this is a transvaginal ultrasound. But here what you're seeing is, okay, so you've got a gestational sac and you've got a yolk sac. If you look at that too quickly, you might be like, oh, great, intrauterine pregnancy, send them home. And actually, this um, was a, a, a case, a similar case came up at um, my, when I was up in Boston at a different institution um, where this happened. And this is pretty unusual, but you know, you've got uterus here, endometrium here, and then you've got this, what well, appears to be an IUP. It's in the uterus, but it's not in the uterus, right? So this endomyometrial mantle is what you need to look at. So if you see a gestational sac and a fetal pole that's sort of hanging off the side of the uterus, you need to be thinking about this. It needs to be at least five to seven millimeters from the edge, so sort of right here, um, is, and that's called the um, endomyometrial mant mantle. And do you guys know what this is called? What kind of pregnancy is this? That's like an interstitial or a corneal pregnancy, right? And those people can get really bad outcomes because the pregnancy can um, develop for quite some time before it ruptures. So look, make sure there's gestational sac, yolk sac, fetal pole, in the uterus, in the uterus. All right, so this sort of brings up undifferentiated hypotension. So, and um, thank you, Russell and Otis, for like your amazing lead in to shock and how to, you know, figure out um, what to do with these kind of scary shock patients. So in this case, you know, someone's coming in, they're two months past their LMP, they have belly pain, they fainted, they're hypotensive, um, and they're having unprotected sex. Like, you know, there's a differential, but it's like one, two, three is ectopic. That's not really the case with a lot of our shock patients, right? Like a lot of these older patients that show up at Miriam and you can't get a history and they're hypotensive, or a lot of the patients that come back as medical cases at Rhode Island, um, 
they come back and they're on differential hypotension, they're in shock, right? So these are patients that we need to get some answers on really quickly because they're sick, right? Something really bad is going on, we don't know what it is. Labs take a while, CAT scans take a while, they may not even be stable enough to go for a CAT scan. So anybody who's got undifferentiated shock really needs an ultrasound like right away. I'll pull the ultrasound over and be ultrasounding them while I'm talking. So you can get a history quickly, you can get a physical exam quickly, and you can figure out some really scary causes of shock at the bedside very quickly with your ultrasound. And so undifferentiated um, shock, you really do need to be thinking about um, ultrasounding them. So is it cardiogenic, distributive, obstructive, hypovolemic? And it's important to differentiate between these really quickly because their managements are like completely different. And so this brings up, oops, excuse me, the rush exam, right? So high map, there's, pump tank uh, pipes. I hate that because I can never remember what's in the tank and what's in the pipes. High map is really easy, right? So someone comes in, they roll into critical care, they have undifferentiated hypotension, you have no idea why, you do high map, heart, IVC, Morrison, aorta, pneumothorax, right? So you look at their heart, is it, um, high, is it um, cardiogenic shock? They have a terrible EF. Um, is it a huge PE? Do they have right heart strain? Is it a big pulmonary, uh, or excuse me, a big um, pericardial effusion? Is it hyperdynamic, in which case you might be thinking more of volume loss? Then you want to look at the IVC. Is it super plethoric, like you're going to see in cardiogenic or obstructive shock? Is it um, kissing, like in some other, if, if they're sort of like septic? Is there blood in the belly? Is there an aortic rupture? Is there a pneumothorax? So heart, IVC, Morrison's aorta, and pneumothorax, that should be done at the bedside for every sick shock patient to help figure out what's going on. So if you go through the different types of shock and you think about what, um, what might be going on, and actually since we're sort of, I'm just gonna take this off since it's really, I know it's really hard to kind of participate on this in the Zoom world. Um, so in someone who's got hypovolemic shock, right, you're gonna think a hyper, hyperdynamic heart, collapsible IVC, if it's from um, trauma, they could have a positive fast. You also wanna think about looking at their aorta. Maybe they've got a huge triple A in their belly and maybe they've got a huge dissection. And so you can look at, um, you know, it's a lot easier to evaluate abdominal aortic pathology than it is to, to evaluate pathology of the aorta in the chest. But you can, you can look at the suprasternal natrio, which we'll talk about, and we've talked about a bunch. You can look at the outflow track on your apical, uh, near parasternal long. So your parasternal long, you know, we always measure the exit, which is your aortic outflow, and it should be less than four centimeters. Anybody who's got like a uh, ascending um, dissection, there's like a 90, high 90% 90 that they're going to have a dilated aortic root. So you can get some information about the aorta in the chest. Distributive shock or sepsis, right, you're going to have totally different ultrasound findings. They're going to be hyperdynamic, again, collapsible IVC. They're not going to have anything going on with their um, aorta. And this is always reminds me of this case, and I wish I remember the resident, but we had a, a patient who was septic, really sick, shock on pressors. We still didn't really, hadn't really sensed a diagnosis, and it was, family was starting to think about, like, literally CMO, because we were at the point of, like, we are like, we need to do, like, central line intubate, and then there was this whole thing of, you know, to what end is, it, is this futile, and the resident was like, no, we don't even really know what's going on yet. Let's ultrasound them. Pulled the ultrasound over. They had, like, a raging cholecystitis, totally changed their management, and they survived a hospital discharge and did really well, so they were almost CMO, and then they did this bedside ultrasound, in, you know, treated them accordingly, and the patient had a good outcome. Um, oops, sorry. I'm controlling my keynote from my phone and sometimes it goes wild on me. All right, obstructive shock, right? You're gonna look at the heart, you're gonna find tamponade, you might find IRV strain. In obstructive shock, you're gonna see a really plethoric IVC. So greater than two centimeters, no respiratory collapse. You might see a DVT. And then cardiogenic shock, you're gonna see really cruddy squeeze, really bad EF. You might see B lines, you might see, um, uh, also a large IVC. And so you can take a quick look at your heart, your IVC, Morrison's pouch, aorta, and lungs for pneumothorax and very quickly figure out what's going on. And these all have really different treatments, right? You're either like draining a tamponade, you're giving um, antibiotics for sepsis, 
um, or you know, you're putting in a chest tube. So these sick patients, you can figure out really critical time-sensitive diagnoses by doing this rush exam. So I know everyone knows about the rush exam, but I think it gets underutilized. So I wanted to bring that up as we talk about shock. And this I sort of added in after Russell's um, talk where he made some comment and I'm quoting him very loosely, but he said something like, I thought they were gonna die and I wasn't sure why. That is the exact patient that I always pull the ultrasound probe over. And this brings up a case I had, um, which was in um, at Newport. And I had a patient who um, came in and um, it was overnight. They had um, chest pain, shortness of breath. They were gray, they were sweaty, they looked terrible. And EMS came in and they were like, um, this patient's got a heart attack, I'm sure of it. You know, he's Joe, we know him. His dad had a heart attack, his brother had a heart attack, everyone in his family has heart attacks. Like, you know, and so I'm already like planning like, okay, EKG, you get this guy transported out of here. There's no cath lab at Newport. And you kind of get this sort of premature closure fixation on MI. We can get the EKG, he's shaking so much, he's sweaty, the leads keep coming off and he looks really bad. So whenever I think a patient looks really bad and like Russell said, I thought they were gonna die and I didn't know why, I pulled the ultrasound over. So chest pain, shortness of breath, my first thought was like, all right, I'll look at his heart. And I looked at his heart and like, you can't rule in or out an MI with a heart, but I looked and it was like, no while my Sean Malley looked perfect, great, amazing squeeze. And then I was like, all right, they're still working on the EKG. I stepped back and I was like, you know, this guy's kind of young. I'm assuming it's an MI, but what else could this be? Let me broaden my differential. And I thought, oh, he had sudden onset chest pain. And wait, he's on a non-rebreather. He's got an optional permit. He's got a PE. So I'm like, all right, I got to stabilize him and try and see if I can get him to CAT scan. And then in the meantime, I look at his heart and there's no right strain, right heart strain whatsoever, right? So what do we know about right heart strain and PEs? You can't rule out a PE if somebody doesn't have right heart strain, but in an unstable patient, you basically can. So if somebody has unstable hemodynamics, so blood pressure less than 90 or a heart rate greater than 110, and you think it's from a PE, they will have an abnormal echo. And this was a multi-center study that got published recently, and it was, Brown was one of the authors, it was Ali Schick and I, Yale and a bunch of other sites. And basically what they showed is in the setting of unstable vitals, um, if it's a PE, you're gonna have an abnormal echo. So his, he had no right heart strain whatsoever. And I'm still thinking like, oh wait, what am I missing? Anyway, I didn't look at his lungs. He had a huge right-sided pneumothorax. So, you know, at this point they finally got the EKG and it's pristine. And I'm like, oh, well actually he needs, he does not need to go to Charlton for the cath lab. This guy just needs a, a pigtail. So. You know, other things you can figure out at the bedside, this image we have over here um, on the left, that's a um, superstar match view with a dissection flap and pretty much all you residents have seen this image a million times. And then over here, we've got um, um, a pneumothorax. Um, um, and so those are things, right? Someone comes in, they're, they look like they're gonna die, you don't know why, chest pain, shortness of breath, pull that ultrasound over. Look for wild motion abnormalities, look for right heart strain, look for a aortic flap, look for a pneumo, right? You can figure this stuff out very quickly and impact patient care. All right, so I'll get off my little soapbox and I'm gonna go on to a much lighter case. So we had a patient recently who came in to Miriam, 63 year old, his foot kind of got stuck in something and he fell over, it twisted. He was able to get himself up and he could stand, um, but he said that his foot felt very like unstable under him. So um, he, felt, he felt just like that it was unstable. So what do you wanna do for this patient? Um, this is somebody, obviously you're gonna, ooh, hold on. You're gonna get an x-ray, right? You're gonna examine them. And, and somebody who's got sort of an unstable um, uh, leg or this sort of twisting injury, anything in particular that you guys can think of that you wanna shout out that you might wanna do on physical exam? So lots of things, right? You're gonna examine it, but one thing that you might look at is the straight leg raise, right? Is the extensor mechanism intact? So this guy had a palpable defect superior to his patella. It felt just boggy and soft. 
his it was a lot of swelling and he was completely unable to lift his leg straight up off the bed and it was not at all related to um, pain he just literally couldn't lift it and so this is a linear probe you can tell by the footprint up at the top and you can see let me just pause the video because i know those videos don't transmit too well and what you can see is this is his quad tendon and it is in complete completely pulled off of the patella and then he's got a lot of anechoic fluid or um, sort of big effusion so um in terms of quadricep tendon tears they're a lot more common than patella tendon more common in over 40 much more common in men more common in the non-dominant um, limb and generally you're going to have a palpable defect and the biggest determinant of management is um, is a complete or partial and this extensor intact and so he ended up getting a um, knee immobilizer and crutches and his orthopedics on the next week to discuss going to the operating room. What I'll say about musculoskeletal ultrasound is that it is much less likely to change your management than the rush exam. And so um, if you never did a musculoskeletal ultrasound, but you promised to do a rush on every hypotensive patient, I would be fine with that. Ultimately, this guy was going to go home with a knee immobilizer and crutches either way. And I'm glad that I was able to, you know, secure the diagnosis and let him know what was going on and show him the image. Um, that's nice, but it's not as important as not, you know, as doing a, a rush on a hypotensive patient and really changing their outcome in a significant way. But it's still cool.